And so uh, I have a few things I want to accomplish this morning. I'm going to be teaching a little bit. You know, my normal operation is proclamation. I've been doing that my whole life, but I want to slow it down a little bit because there are some things I think we need to say. I think if we don't say this, we only alienate ourselves from society at large. And so some things kind of hit us stronger when we just go really slow and share some verses we normally haven't shared. Secondly, at the end of it, I want to address some issues that we face in our society today, if I have time, and then we always want to leave time for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, for God's healing power to touch people and have your needs met, because God loves you. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God really cares about you. All right, and then this afternoon I will teach on your ever-increasing faith at the one o'clock service. And, and so uh, last Sunday I began to address certain topics. I said I'm teaching about God without religion. I didn't really address that title very much, but I think we can agree today that if Jesus did anything, he exposed and rebuked religion. He made religion look bad. And the Apostle Paul picked up on that from Jesus and he does the same thing. Now, the, the word that we get religion is relegare, which means to bind up. Of course, there could be a positive understanding of that word when we are binding people close to the love of God. That would be good. But there could also be a binding of people up to a religious system, binding people into a uh, performance, into a ritual. No, we're not going to worry about it now. It's a little too late. So you just go back there. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and so uh, let me, I got interrupted there. So let's, let's everybody stay put. I said, uh, let me rephrase that again. So I say that religion in the negative sense can be binding people closely in their mind and their affection to a systemic a religious uh, ritual that they perform and think that they're going to gain closeness to God. And so, you know, sometimes religion is like a con man, the way Jesus describes it. Let's imagine somebody coming to your door and saying, well, my car just broke down and, uh, you know, I'm waiting for the uh, people come and help me here, but could I use your washroom? And so the, you say, oh, you're a nice neighbor. So you say, come on in. And then uh, the person uses your washroom and uh, goes back to his car. And you notice that your nice pearl necklace is gone. And the nice watch that you got last Christmas, kind of an expensive one, it's gone. But then the next day, the same person comes back again to your door and says, I hear you are um, missing a, a necklace and a watch here. Well, I have them for sale. For a very special price, you can buy this. And there you are being such a nice person. You say, you, you buy it. You buy it back. Then the next week, the same person comes and now he's got a different hard luck story and says, can I, can I use your telephone? And you let him in again. And then certainly you notice certain items are missing. And then the, you offer to, to buy them back. That, that's how religion works. It cons you. It sucks us in to pay for that which already belongs to us. Again and again and again with different scams. And Jesus exposes and rebukes that. You know, sometimes we say, we say, well, I'm a born again person. I don't want, I don't want religion. I just want Jesus. But respectfully, I say, some people who talk like that are the most religious of them all. And, and show the attributes of religion, of ability to condemn and be condescending towards others. You know, Jesus, in speaking of religion, in John 10, 10, he said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Note what I say here. This is not a reference to the devil. I don't care how many preachers have said this is the devil. No, very clearly, this figurative speech, which Jesus calls it, or which is called in John chapter 10, it refers to that Jesus says, thieves are those who put forth various religious schemes how to access God. And those who do that other than through the finished work of Jesus are called thieves and robbers. So the thief of religion does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy you. 
Makes sense, because remember Paul said later on, the letter of the religious law kills. So it, it fits in. Jesus says, I have come. Come on, are you hearing this? I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. That's God's words for you. So what is the solution in view of Jesus' dealings and words that he spoke about religion? Well, the solution is abandon religion altogether. In fact, I submit to you that if you take the last 27 books of the Bible, the Gospels, Paul's writings, the book of Hebrews, is God is pleading with you passionately to leave religion behind. Uh, we think, well, you know, I, I have Jesus, but you know, you know, I need a little religion to keep me on the straight and narrow. You know, I, I, I need a little, you, you know, just to have Jesus and religion. You know, we, we sometimes talk about people when they come from a religion where there are many gods and they worship many, many gods. Some of them have millions of gods. And we say, well, it's so easy for those people. They just add Jesus and make him another one of their gods. But you know what happens in, in Christianity? We, we just say, well, we, we'll have Jesus along with all of our own man-made rituals and our own ideas. But the idea from God's word is leave religion behind. So I want to give you some reasons for that. First of all, Jesus is incompatible with religion. Just as a mix with it. And to make this abundantly clear... The Bible gives us one little point that many maybe haven't seen is in the book of Hebrews where it says in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 13 concerning Jesus, Jesus Christ belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar the, in the temple. It is evident that the Lord descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses said nothing concerning priest. This is a big deal. It's many other verses that talk about that in the same context. It says here, as far as the Hebrew religion is concerned, Jesus is an illegitimate high priest. Leave the verse up there. Moses never said a word about someone from the tribe of Judah being a priest. If you were a priest, you had to be from the tribe of Levi. So here, they make a big deal. That Jesus, according to the Jewish religion, was not qualified to be a high priest. Why would God do that? You know, well, what's the big deal? Why couldn't God just make Jesus born in the tribe of Levi? Much, so much more palatable. So much easier. You know, so much more acceptable. I guess God wasn't looking for a smooth transition. God was looking to turn religion on its head. Could that be true for us? Could that be true for Peter Youngren, for you? That when we have clung to religion, that God isn't looking for it to kind of be just kind of smooth and easy. You just go along there with Jesus and religion and kind of mix it all together in one soup. Could it be that God wants to turn it on its head for you? And then it says the verse prior, when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of the law also. So he says here, since the whole priesthood has changed, the whole system must, must change. So we don't have the gospel as an outgrowth of religion before it. No, it's, it's, it's a new order. And as to maybe insult the religious thinking of the contemporaries even more. It says in Hebrews 5.10, Jesus is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now for us Christians, we like that. You know, people, oh, even Pastor Nathan at the communion talked about, as I often have, about Melchizedek. But think about it from the religious perspective. Melchizedek had no father or mother. He had no genealogy. So Melchizedek also is completely unqualified. So you could say that Jesus became a high priest, certainly by grace, not by law. There was nothing in Jesus' lineage that made him worthy to become a high priest. 
So what God is saying through Jesus Christ is, I am not following the religious system of merits and you earning thing. I'm establishing a brand new order that is for all people, regardless of your background. Jesus is not compatible with your religion. He is a brand new order. So don't try to mix the oil and the vinegar. Are you with me? Let me give you more. Religion does not deliver, not even for the best. This is something that we must recognize. Religion doesn't deliver. It it promises things. If you do this and this and this, then God is going to do such and such, but it doesn't deliver. Think about the superheroes in the Bible. You know, the superheroes. I mean, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, every one of them. And and I mean, these are the people like we put them up here. Their religion did not deliver for them. And I know you you think I'm just saying this, so I better give you a scripture verse to back it up. It says in Hebrews 11, 39, these, referring to all these heroes, all these people I mentioned and many more like them, these having gained approval through faith, did not receive what was promised. So it didn't deliver for them. Would you like to practice a religion that doesn't deliver for you? All right, nobody's answering anything. So look at it, let me give you Galatians 3.10. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the law to do them. This is the curse. Some of you think a curse is some statue in your living room, but a curse is that religion tells you to do things. Try harder, but if you fail in one, and everybody will fail in at least one, probably many, then you are cursed with it all. This is the sad thing of religion. And we can get caught up in religion of making promises. You know, if you take these five steps, you do these seven things, here are eight keys to your victory. And we try to do all those, but in the end of it, it doesn't deliver for us either. James 2.10, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of everything. I, I expect you to be quiet at that point. Because that point is meant to drive us to utter hopelessness. If you keep all of it, but you stumble in one principle, one thing, you're guilty in everything. No wonder many religious people and Christians included, they, they, they are like that old Greek mythological figure, Atlas. Remember that depiction of Atlas carrying the world on his shoulders? How many have seen that? That's how many Christians are. They're carrying their failures, their fears, their burdens. They're carrying it on their shoulders, weighted down. Am I good enough to God? Have I measured up? Have I done everything I should to get a breakthrough? And so they are burdened down. But here is the good news. Jesus has lifted that burden off. Come on, let's give him praise right now for that. I I, I mean... I mean, it says in in Romans 3.19, it says, by the works of the law, no human will be justified. No one. Not Moses. You know, Moses received the law and then he broke it himself. David, all of them, every one of them failed because their religion did not deliver. That's why Jesus is exposing religious hypocrisy. And religion in general. And Paul continues in the same vein. Then here comes a third reason. This is going to be the shocker. Are you ready? Religion makes people sin more. Makes you sin more. Now, of course, I'm going to back this up with the Bible verse, but I want you to look at the principle first. Because this goes against what people think. They think, Religion is a modifying something that kind of pushes you in the right direction. But I'm here to teach the scripture and the revelation given to us through Jesus Christ and his apostles. And I must tell you, religion makes you sin more. 
If you want more sin in your family, introduce more religion. If you want more sin in Canada, introduce religion more. Because religion makes people sin more. God's grace stops sin. So let me give you a scripture verse from 2 Corinthians 3, 7. I will just give you an excerpt because I have taught that so many times where it says, the ministry of death engraved in letters on stone. And then it goes on to say that this ministry of death, the letter that kills, it condemns you, it has fading glory, and it says that that which was written on tablets of stone points out the sin that you are struggling with, points out, kind of probes the area where you're struggling, and then triggers and activates you to act out that weakness. That's the teaching of the Bible. I'll show it in a moment. And so some people say, well, you know, when we, we're dead to the law and all that, but well, that doesn't mean the Ten Commandments. But here's very clearly referring to the Ten Commandments because the ceremonial laws were not written on tablets of stone. So here it says we, 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 we think the Ten Commandments are true morally, but it says very clearly that the 10 commandments, that which is written on tablets of stone, it has a ministry of death. And you can read all of that yourself, but I've taught it so many times. So let me give you just one example. In Romans 7, Paul writes, is the law sin? On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting, coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. So here he is quoting the ninth commandment. Out of the ten, number nine is quoted. You shall not covet. He said that's how I knew about coveting. But sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. That's an enormous statement. Paul gives his testimony. He says, I coveted every kind of coveting. King James says, all manner of coveting. So Paul says, my testimony is, I coveted everything. He probably coveted, lusted after possessions, sex, food. Who knows what he lusted? He says, he lusted after everything. Don't look at me like that. Are you still here? And what does he blame as the cause for this coveting? Which is because the devil, the demons were just coming around me because I have such a destiny on my life and I had to fight. No, no, he says, it was the ninth commandment. Commandment number nine caused me to sin. You can see why sometimes we have said when I'm not teaching but proclaiming, don't put up the Ten Commandments in school. Put John 3.16 on a plaque. That, that'll transform your life. But here he says the Ninth Commandment. You look like you've never read the Bible. Some of you look stunned. Have you never read this? You're supposed to read a chapter a day or something. Surely you came to Romans chapter 7 at some point. And it's pretty plain that the Ninth Commandment, not the devil, the Ninth Commandment, produced in Paul all manner of lusting and covetousness. And we know that's true, even from personal experience. You remember as a child, I've told the story that, you know, my toys were in the room that I slept, but one day mom had cleaned the living room, especially because we had company coming over that night. And I never used to play in the living room in our house in the little village we lived. But that day, mom said to me, now, Peter, you cannot play in the living room because I've cleaned it and there's company coming. And I remember it aroused in me the desire to play in the living room. I still remember, I must have been five or six years old, standing in the hallway and it was an open to the living room and I was checking, where's mom? And as soon as she wasn't watching, I ran into the living room. And I mean, I kind of remember feeling kind of a, 
I don't know, some kind of a strange joy. Oh, I'm in the living room. I'm in, no, it, was, it was never a big deal to me before that. But the moment she had given the commandment, I, I, I wanted to go there. Some of you are guilty of the same thing. Sometimes I test people. People who are attentively following my preaching. And in the middle of the sermon I will say, oh, don't look around. There's a naked person at the back. Don't look. And of course you know now you're not looking because you know I'm teasing you. But if I don't give the preface and the teaching, people, they can't control themselves. They have to just look around. Even though they were not at all tempted to look back before, but the moment I say you cannot, it's like you walk down your street, to go for a walk, get a little fresh air, and you just walk by the houses. But one day, somebody has put a huge sign by the curbside, no trespassing. And you have hardly even noticed this house before. You just walk by there, just singing along, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And all of a sudden, it says no trespassing. It's like, oh, you, you, you kind of want to trespass. You want to look. What's going on? So religion makes you sin more. And then it makes you cover what you did. So what is... The gist of this, and I say this is the principle. We have no spiritual relationship with the Ten Commandments. We have a moral relationship, historical relationship. We believe the Ten Commandments are valid as far as helping us to have laws in our country, but we have no spiritual commandment relationship. We have not like, oh, I trust in them. If I could just memorize them. We do not have any spiritual relationship with the Ten Commandments if we are gospel people. Because if we are gospel people, we have died from the law and we are risen to a new husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he lives in us and our spiritual relationship is with him. And so, you know, people who lift up the Ten Commandments so much, they break them themselves, of course. Just take the Sabbath commandment. That means that from sunset Friday... To sunset Saturday, you can't cook, you can't fill your gas tank, you can't go anywhere. And they say, well, well, well I, I, don't, I just follow the others. Oh, so it's not the Ten Commandments, it's the nine now. And we can start picking aside, well, what about making an image? I noticed you have a necklace with a cross. Oh, well, that's a, that's a graven image. I know you have a little angel there. Oh, well, I, well, so now we're down to eight. You see, people, we cherry pick like that. So I'm saying, what have I? I said religion doesn't deliver. I've proven from the Bible, religion makes you sin more. It, it pokes at something in you to want to do wrong. How many want me to talk about the solution a bit? Everybody shout the solution. Well, the solution is a brand new contract. God has given us a contract that is not religious in its nature. You know, usually I'm a stickler for reading the Bible. I don't read the paraphrased translations, but I'm going to read from the Message Bible this time because I think it really sums it up. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 to 12 from the Message Bible. And it reads, and you'll see it on the screen. Heads up, everyone. The days are coming. When I'll set up a new plan, I'll throw out the old plan that I set up with their ancestors when I led them out of the land of Egypt. They didn't keep their part of the bargain, so I looked away and let it go. So that's something. God says they didn't, they didn't do what they were supposed to do, but I looked away. I thought, that's something to think about. This new plan I'm making is not going to be written on paper. It's not going to be chiseled in stone. This time, I'm writing the plan in them, carving it on the lining of their hearts. I will be their God, and they'll be my people. They won't go to school to learn about me or buy a book called God in Five Easy Lessons. They'll all get to know me firsthand, the small and the great, and here it comes. They'll get to know me by being kindly forgiven. Oh, and their sins forever wiped clean. That's how you get to know God in the new covenant, that he kindly forgave you. 
and he wiped the slate clean. That's how we know God. That's a whole new way. Without anything on our part, he wiped it clean. And then I got to get, I got to, since I'm in the message Bible, I wrote down here, verse 13, the next verse, it says, by coming up with a new plan, a new covenant, God put the old plan on the shelf. And there it stays gathering dust. <laughs> you know, it's like there is your old cassette player. You know, with all the cassettes that you played, it's over there somewhere on a shelf. It's obsolete. It was good for its day, but you got something better. You got MP3 and you got this and you got that. And you say, I'm not going to stick with that. I keep it on the shelf. So a, a, a new agreement. So I just highlight a few things. God said that the people fail. He found fault with them. And he let it go. That's a thought, something to think about. He let it go. And then this new contract, we don't enact it. We're not even signatories to it. We are the beneficiaries. God said, I'm going to give a new plan. And I'm making this covenant with myself. If I had time, I would quote Hebrews 6, 18, where it says, there are two immutable things involved in this new covenant what are the two immutable things? It's God and God. God the Father and God the Son. And on the basis of that, Paul was able to write in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, and we don't want to be faithless, but if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Look, look at that. In other words, he says, I made a new covenant I made a better covenant. It's not based on if I can find a fault in them or not. It's not based on that. That's not the equation. So that covenant makes it possible. And we don't want to be faithless. In fact, when I preach like this, more than ever, you want to be faithful. Because you say, what a wonderful God we have. What a wonderful Savior who has provided so beautifully. But it says, if we are faithless, He remains faithful. Oh, I could give you many verses on this. Just one more there. Philippians 1, 6. He who has begun a good work among you, he will complete it. Everybody say, he will complete it. So it's a new contract. Then there's a new belonging. Everybody say belonging. You know, one of the most infamous royalties in history is Marie Antoinette, uh, who was beheaded in the French Revolution eventually because of uh, many things, I'm not going to go into that. But the historians tell us uh, she was an Austrian princess. And she was, for political reasons, going to marry the prince or the dauphin of France. And so history describes how a beautiful Austrian royal carriage carried her with all the Austrian clothing and whatever they had at that time, but was a great empire, to the French border. And at the French border, at the age of 14 years old, she was met by a French carriage. And so the delegations met and they handed Marie Antoinette over from the Austrian authorities to the French authorities. And she's carrying a little poodle that she had grown up with, a little dog for comfort. You know, she was clinging to this little poodle. You can see that. And they took her over to the French side. There was a tent put up. And uh, these uh, representatives of the French court they took her into the tent and completely undressed her, took every, her shoes, everything on her until she was naked. And they put all the Austrian clothing in a pile and they dressed her in French clothing. Everything had to be French. They changed her hairstyle to make it look more French. And finally they took the poodle and sent it back to the Austrian delegation say, this belongs to her old life. Take it back with you to Austria. And later on, her life didn't end so good, but that's not my point. And so she was stripped of everything that she had known, and she entered into a new territory. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says in Romans 7, 4, you also were put to death in regard to the law through the body of Christ so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. This is your story. Now, can you imagine if she had been crying? Well, I want my, I want my Austrian socks. 
I want my Austrian sweater. I want my poodle. Oh, that would have been trouble. But that's what many Christians are doing. They say, I want, I want my religion. Give me that old time religion. I want that religion. I want, I want the things there. Uh, you know, t- to just be with Jesus is kind of scary. Can I bring some of the old stuff with me? No, you have died to the old stuff. He lifted you up from the miry clay of religion and he put your feet on the solid rock. You belong to another. Can somebody say amen to that? You're you're not a part of that kingdom of religion where you grovel and feel ashamed, where preachers intimidate you and condemn you and make you feel you're not good enough. You leave that. You abandon that. And you have now been translated. Oh, I'm starting to preach here now. I was going to go slow, but I'm going fast. You've been translated into the new kingdom of the Son, Jesus Christ, the world's light. You are with him now. Oh, thank you. Then break fellowship with religion. Break it off. Paul addresses this in Colossians 2. He says, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. He's referred to various rules. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. According to the commandments and teachings of man, these are matters which have an appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and humility and severe punishment, treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Fleshly indulgence will be to do sinful things. He says all these things, all these rules, he says don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. It looks very holy. There's an appearance of wisdom. Wow. Oh, there's an appearance of self-made religion. That's the word. And it appears even humble. It's appearance in humility. It looks like, oh, this person is really committed. But in actuality, it has no power against sin. And we can see that. People can look very holy. And they can have all the appearances. But none of that has any power to give you a victorious life. How many want to live victorious? You want a victorious life? Of course you do. And so all those things, all those rituals we go through and we have plenty in the evangelical world. You can blow your little shofar and you could do your little thing and think that all these things, that's going to release the anointing and you can, forget it. Look spiritual. You look like you're really committed, but it has no power against fleshly indulgences. You see, we are such suckers for religion. No matter how ineffective and obsolete it is, we get sucked in. Everybody say, not me. Now, some might object and say, what about, you know, the Bible says Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. Let's read that. In Matthew 5, 17, it says, do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill, or you could say to complete. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass. And I'm reading here, until all things are accomplished. So oh, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. And yet it says we are dead to the law. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So look at what this verse says. And I highlight it. If you follow the law, the religious law, you must obey even the smallest letter. Every stroke you must obey. So I hope you're not mixing nylon with wool today. I hope that you stone your children to death if they are rebellious in the city gate. And if you did that, you wouldn't be here because you would be in jail. I I mean, you're, 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 you're liable for everything. And I hope you haven't had any pork or shrimp or Thinking of the Filipino food now. I wonder what I ate last Sunday here. I, I hope you, you know, don't come and say, well, I kind of have my favorite seven commandments out of the 10. No, 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 no. You're guilty in everything. So don't try to get away with anything. If you're going to try to please God by religion, my hat's, well, my hat's not off to you, but <laughs> foolishness. Then, When all is fulfilled, Jesus said, the law becomes obsolete. 
I've already showed you how Jesus didn't fulfill the law's requirement for being a high priest. Six times Jesus said, Moses said, but I say to you. So don't tell me that Jesus fulfilled the letter of the law because he absolutely didn't or he wouldn't be a high priest. So I would say Jesus is not one in a long line. We kind of have, you know, Moses, Elijah, David. No, Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the end of the line. He is, so all things have been accomplished. All things. And the heaven and earth is a, a hyperbole expression that nothing, you know, heaven and earth would pass before this would change until all things are fulfilled. And all things are fulfilled. Jesus is not one in the line. No, he is the end of the line. In him, the fullness of God dwells physically. He is the expressed image of God. And so how do we live? Live by the commandments of Jesus. Oh yeah, we have commandments in the new covenant. Several times stated in the gospel of John, John 13, 34. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I've loved you. That you also love one another. That's our commandment. John in 1 John said it this way. When he talks about he who loves me keeps my commandments. And says, this is my commandment. This is Jesus' commandment. This is his commandment. 1 John 3.23. That we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ. And love one another. Just as he commanded us. This is the commandment we live under. To love one another as he loved us. And as if those two verses weren't enough, let me give you a third one. So don't say, oh, we have no commandments. No, we have the commandment of Jesus. Paul said it this way, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor, not just one another, but your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, law, love is the fulfillment of the law. Hallelujah. So if you love your neighbor, you don't commit adultery with your neighbor's wife or husband. You don't murder them. You don't steal. You don't covet their stuff. That's what we live by. It's not a Lesser commandment is a higher commandment. So I say like this to summarize it. Is Jesus' commandment to us is to embrace God's love and then transmit that love to others. That, that's what we live by. That's, if you want to know what our standard is, we receive God's love and we give it to others. In a moment, I'm going to start meddling. The last five minutes are going to be the most dangerous. So hang tight. I say we receive his love. And we transmit it to others. Maybe say, well, what's the difference then? You know, if, if, you, if you just live by the Ten Commandments or if you just live by this new law, it's all the same, isn't it? Anyhow, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter a lot. The motivation that differs. If you follow religion, first of all, you will not succeed. Secondly, you're driven by fear of punishment. You're driven by fear of punishment. If I don't do right, God's going to get me. But in the new covenant, you're not driven by fear of punishment. You're driven by love. And you know that even if you were faithless, he will still be faithful. So you're not driven by that fear. You're driven by love. I love him who loved me first. So I want to talk for a moment about this loving our neighbor. And, 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 and by the way, another thing to say, who wants to sin anyhow? Paul talks about that. I don't have time to quote it, but why put yourself into something that's going to make you feel ashamed and stressed when you can participate in God's divine nature? Why not put on the new clothing, as Paul says in Colossians, of compassion and kindness and humility and patience? So what does it mean to love your neighbor? What about if your neighbor belongs to the LGBTQ community? Mm, now it got quiet. What if your neighbor has gender dysphoria? What about something else? What if your neighbor belongs to a different religion? 
Sometimes I think we make a mistake of not understanding what love is. For example, in our country, we have something that was passed into law in 2016 called MAID. It stands for Medical Assistance in Death. It's another way to call it this, assisted suicide. And when it was passed into law in 2016, it was discussed that uh, it would uh, uh, maybe be for just 100 people or so a year who, who, who their death was coming anyhow, and many of us didn't like that. But last year, 10,000 Canadians, and it's growing exponentially, and over 10,000 had assisted suicide. Our taxpayer money went to assist people in suicide. And now there's a new law coming into effect in March of next year that even if you have mental illness, you, can be, you should be recommended assistance in death. Now, you know, when I talk about this, you're like, I'm standing up for God. I'm, no, I'm standing up for people. And I say to you lovingly, whether you watch me on television or you're here in the auditorium, if you come under such a heavy depression, and I hope you don't, I hope you, this teaching we give you helps you so you don't, but if you do, and if that is recommended to you, we have different options of treatment and made, it's such a nice name, isn't it? Made. Sound like someone's going to come and help you cook around the house. Medical assistance in death. Don't take it. I'm not saying that to make myself look, I'm standing up for God. You know, God doesn't need someone to stand up for him. He can stand up for himself. Many, too many Christians are trying to stand up for God. Don't try to stand up for God. He can handle himself. Don't you worry. But I'm saying it because I love you. I'm saying it and tell your friends. Because I love you. I love my neighbor. It would cause me great grief to think that this was presented to someone and because of the despair and darkness, they said yes to it and suddenly they're gone. So we're not motivated by this. We're fighting the government and we're standing up for our values. No, we stand up for people. We love people. People have different opinions about gender, a lot of different opinions. But I, I, I say what, what causes me to love is when I think of a 14-year-old boy who thinks he's a girl and, and for different reasons. Maybe his life has been tough and so then he's recommended hormonal treatment which is really using chemicals that will fry his testicles in an irreversible way. And love in me says, don't do that when you're 14 years old or 12. Don't do it. I love you too much. It's not like, oh, I'm, take, I'm going to fight here with the laws of Canada. No, it's love. And so I say to you, in our society, there are too many Christian voices that say, we're standing for righteousness. We're standing for God. Just sit down. God can stand on his own. Thank you very much. So I want to make it very clear. And I was looking at this, you know, Tina, we were out driving a bit. Yes, she was reading an article to me as I was driving of a 10-year-old girl. It was about her family. And she had been born in the 23rd week, which is well into the second trimester. And yes, there were complications at her birth. But she's doing fine, living a normal life. So when we discuss abortion, it's not like, hey, God's going to judge our country. We don't talk like that. We have a commandment from Jesus to love people. And that little girl mentioned in that article, born in the 23rd week, I'm glad that she's alive. I'm glad that she's living. That's, we love people. We love people. So at least let's tell people honestly the truth. And for that one who was a, committed some crime, that person who was a child molester, whatever they were, we don't condone anything like that. But if that is your neighbor, God is not the God of retribution. God is the God of restoration. And he can restore so great that everything changes. And I'm saying to us, I'm saying we're living in a society. You know, the church is in a mammoth decline. Great denominations are closing their doors. Churches are selling. It's happening all over Toronto. If you follow real estate market, it's happening in Vancouver, all over. They're selling churches that have been there for 100 years because nobody's coming out anymore. 
We're not going to continue by compromising the gospel, but we are going to continue by getting to know the gospel better. We are not going to continue by following just along what some other person has done and you know, kind of showing off and I'm protesting this and I'm against this and I'm, I'm this and you, you do this and that. No, we are motivated by love. Love, loving people. So I say to you today, reject religion. Reject religion in all its forms, including Pentecostal religion that causes people to condemn other people and sit in a high horse and point their finger at other people. Reject religion and ponder how much God loves you. Accept the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I mean when I say God without religion.